Welcome to day 13 of praying through the Psalms. Today we are looking at Psalms 25 and 26. So Psalm 25 is a return to the lament. We had a break from those um, for the past couple of times. Well, we've seen at least some other forms of Psalm, but now we are back to our lamenting. It's an individual lament and it's written by David. In the Hebrew, this is an acrostic. And that means that it's um, according to the Hebrew alphabet. So each line starts with the letter, corresponding letter of the Hebrew alphabet in order. And it was created with a generic purpose in mind for anyone who was seeking God's help in a time of distress. So when we think of the Psalms, a lot of times the psalmist is writing something very personal. Um, David will write a lament, you know, because of something going on in his own life. But he would also create psalms, laments, prayers for generic purposes, for people who needed the words of prayer for their own circumstances when they would come to the temple to pray to God. Um, and that seems to be what this is. And the psalm is bookended by these interesting phrases in verses 2 and 20, do not let me be put to shame. That seems to be the theme of the psalm. And here, shame is referring to something that results from having our hope or trust be disappointed by someone or something. And so if we adjust the translation from the NIV of verse 3, it would read like this, Indeed, all who are waiting for you will not be disappointed, but they will be disappointed, those who are transgressing vainly or emptily. So that idea in the Hebrew is, you know, the people who are turning away from God, not waiting patiently for God's answer, will, purpose, but instead just going forward, transgressing, and doing it with emptiness because any human effort that is not aligned with the will of God is going to come amount to nothing in the end. It won't be lasting, whereas when we trust in God, that reward is everlasting. So the cause of the distress in this psalm is the sin and the past sins of the psalmist. And so the ending verse about shame is a personal one. Preserve my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed or disappointed for I trust in you. And in the middle, we have this discussion about sin and faithfulness and um God forgiving and blessing the one who follows God. Very Old Testament, but uh, we can still use it in our purposes. We would just want to add in some language of Jesus Christ into here. So we're, whereas um, the psalmist is talking about keeping the demands of the covenant, which was the way that people had a relationship with God in the Old Testament, we would talk about following Jesus Christ, which is the way we have a relationship with God in New Testament faith. But otherwise, this can still be a good generic psalm to pray when we are feeling um, the weight of sin, past or present, when we are feeling that kind of shame that comes from um, past sin, that sometimes the enemy capitalizes on that and brings it back to mind. And we, you know, ruminate over things that we did in the past, which God has forgiven already, but they come back up. Um, those kind of instances would be a good example. Psalm 26 is a little different. Uh, it's a tricky one. It's super specific. And it's interesting because as humble as the words are in Psalm 25, they kind of almost feel prideful, the words of Psalm 26. So the theme here is pleading for vindication from false and unjust accusations. We've seen this already. These type of Psalms typically begin in earnest. Usually they're missing that opening address, you know, oh Lord, I love you so much or whatever. It just kind of jumps right into the request as we see here. And this psalm, as I said, can come across as prideful. Uh, but again, remember, we're talking Old Testament. And so where this individual is pleading his case before God, and he's telling God, I've kept the law, I've remained pure. And that was indeed the terms of the covenant. That was how they maintained a relationship with God. Um, for us, it's different. So we can kind of 
try to look at it through the lens of someone in the Old Testament time. First of all, he's pleading his case to God. He's not standing in front of thousands of people and saying how great he is. And he's asking God to recognize his steadfast efforts to hold to the covenant and to see that indeed he is someone who is innocent of whatever these charges are that have been brought against him. And the psalmist asked for his life to be spared from these accusations. So whatever they were accusing him of, it must have meant potential punishment of death. Um, and that the reasoning is because he loves worshiping God in the temple. That's what he's talking about in verse 8. So this is a worthy reason. He's not saying, oh, I'm innocent, spare my life because I'm such a great person. He's saying, spare my life because I want to worship you. I want to be in that heavenly, you know, the throng of the great con congregation praising you um, in the temple setting. So through the lens of the New Testament, we would adjust this a bit and plead not our own purity and our own righteousness, but we would plead the blood and purity and righteous blamelessness of Jesus Christ. And so anytime there's talk of covenant or following God's laws, uh, we would talk about following Jesus Christ and the grace God has extended to us through Jesus, and then we would ask God to judge us on that basis. So as I said, Psalm 25, we might pray when in distress because of our sins, past or present, or if we're struggling with doubt in terms of our faith, because this Psalm talks a lot about not being disappointed by putting our trust in God. And that's an important thing to remind ourselves of. You could even maybe pray this Psalm if you're waiting on something, a request from, from God, a prayer that you've prayed for years and years and years and, and your eyes haven't seen fulfilled yet. Um, this is a good reminder that God plays the long game. I've talked about that before. And patience is rewarded if we are faithful and, and maintain our faith in God. Psalm 26, definitely more specific. Uh, we would use this if we found ourselves in a situation in which we feel falsely accused or, you know, maybe maliciously gossiped about, something like that. Um, but we would pray this. We would really want to adjust this language to reflect Jesus. Pray this in light of Jesus, recognizing Jesus' purity and goodness, and praying for God to judge us because hopefully we've been following the feet of Jesus and that's that should prove that we are innocent of whatever false accusations are being leveled against us. But always would pray this with humility and asking God to be our judge. And this is, again, something done in personally, us before God. So it takes some of that element of pride out of it because you're talking to God and saying, God, I feel like I follow Jesus and, you know, for the most part, I am doing a good job in doing that, and yet I'm still being falsely accused, so Lord, help me in this situation. That's definitely a correct prayer, um, and we can bring that before God. And if we are um, not correct, and if we've been lapsed in our following of Jesus, God will bring that to our minds, and we can deal with that in our prayer time. So this morning, I'm not going to pray Psalm 26 because it is so very specific, but certainly if you find yourself in that situation, you can just, as I've shown you in the past, adjust it so that, you know, you just add in some of Jesus into that Psalm. So this morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you're listening to this, we are going to pray Psalm 25. I'm going to, you're going to see me adjusting the language to reflect Jesus and as we pray, I'll give us a pause to think about any sins that we want to confess. And also, I just want you to think about any shame over those past sins that have been forgiven. Um, I will pause for that as well. And let's just name those and give them up once and for all and pray for God to take even the memory of that from our minds and just that we would own and recognize the forgiveness and mercy that we've been granted in Jesus and that um, shame would not be part of, of our inner mind conversation any longer. So let's pray together. Psalm 25. Gracious God, in you I put my trust. I trust in you, God, so do not let me be disappointed don't let my enemies triumph over me, the enemies of 
temptation and sin and destruction and violence and emotions gone awry and all the other things that come against us, including sometimes other human beings. Because God, we know that no one who hopes in you will ever be disappointed, but they will be disappointed that the people who turn away from you and transgress and do so with empty vanity. So Lord, we pray, show us your ways, teach us your paths, guide us in your truth and teach us for you are God, our savior, and our hope is in you all day long. Lord, thank you that you are merciful and loving and that you have been from the beginning of time. Lord, thank you that in Jesus Christ, you no longer remember the sins of our youth and our rebellious ways. Lord, you just remember us as your children because you, Lord, are good. You are good and you are upright and you instruct even sinners in your ways. And then you sent us Jesus to guide us in what is right and to teach us your way and to allow us to humble ourselves and submit to following him. Lord, all of your ways are loving and faithful towards those who follow the feet of Jesus. For the sake of your name, gracious God, forgive us of our sins, even if they are great. And Lord, we now pray those sins and um, confess them to you. So Lord, we ask that we would be people who fear you. We know you will instruct us in the ways that we should choose if we follow Jesus. Then our days will end up prosperous and we will enter into your eternal kingdom. Lord, you confide in those you who fear you through the power of your Holy Spirit living within us. You make your love, your covenant of grace through Jesus Christ known to us. And so Lord, may we each say, my eyes are ever on you. For only you can release us from the snare of sin and darkness and death. And indeed, in Jesus, you already have. You have turned to us and you have been gracious to us. So God, I pray for those listening to my voice right now, for those who are lonely and afflicted, be gracious to them. Relieve the troubles of our hearts, Lord, and free those who are experiencing anguish. Look on the afflicted and on those in distress and take away the shame and stain and pain of sin. Lord, for those who feel surrounded by enemies, surrounded by fierce hatred, Lord, deliver them. Guard our lives, Lord, for you have rescued us in Jesus Christ. Already we know that we will not be disappointed if we take refuge in you. So may it be so, God. May the integrity and uprightness and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ protect us because our hope, Lord, is in you. So God, I pray, deliver me and deliver all those praying with me from our troubles and help us to follow after Jesus with confidence, with no shame, Lord, but with the goodness and grace and mercy that you extend to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.